our tour of historic England. Hello, Lindsay Holiday here. This is my mom, Wendy, my travel buddy, and we have just spent eight amazing days traveling through England. We started off in London, visited Kensington Palace, the Tower of London, Buckingham Palace's Queen's Gallery, and we went on a ghost walk. Then we camped out all night on the Mall to see the coronation of King Charles III and Queen Camilla. Then we drove on the left side of the road to the Ostrich Inn, England's third oldest and very haunted inn. We visited Hampton Court and Windsor, then drove to Hever Castle and Leeds Castle, where we're staying for the last two nights of our trip. It's been a whirlwind tour and so exciting to be in the actual places that I talk about so often and soak up the history. And I'm so excited to take you on our trip with us. We landed at 6.30 a.m. on Wednesday, May 3rd and took the Gatwick Express to Victoria Station. We stopped by the hotel to freshen up and drop off our bags, grab some breakfast at the tea shop and headed straight to nearby Kensington Palace. This royal residence was purchased by William and Mary in 1689, the year they took the throne in the Glorious Revolution. The pollution in London set off William's asthma, so they bought a two-story suburban mansion surrounded by acres of parkland and commissioned architect Sir Christopher Wren to transform it into a royal palace. For 70 years, their successors invested in lavish renovations and gardens until George III bought Buckingham House and moved his family there. At that point, Kensington was split up into grace and favor, aka basically free, apartments for members of the extended royal family. The current exhibition, Crown to Couture, featured some historic costumes and a ton of iconic modern designs, like Katy Perry's chandelier dress, Beyonce's gold Grammys dress, Billy Porter's sun god outfit, and a lot more. If you're a fan of modern fashion, I'm sure you'd be blown away. But we were there for the history and were a bit disappointed that the royal apartments were in the dark background, covered up by loud modern music and staging. There were quieter exhibits of historic royal family jewels and about Queen Victoria's childhood, which we enjoyed very much. Victoria was born and raised at Kensington. I'll be doing a video all about her childhood under the harsh Kensington system and her often forgotten half-brother and sister in the future. Prince Charles and Princess Diana moved into a Kensington apartment shortly after their wedding and raised William and Harry here. Diana remained in the home after the divorce. That apartment and those recently occupied by Prince William and Princess Catherine, Prince Harry and Meghan, and Princess Eugenie are not on the tour. But behind this stone barbed wire wall, there is a new memorial statue of Princess Diana in the gardens. We gathered the shreds of our energy to walk to the Laughing Halibut fish and chip shop. We got the cod and halibut and both preferred the halibut. Malt vinegar is not for us. Day two, after a lovely hotel breakfast, we took the tube to the Tower of London. When we arrived at 9 a.m., the UK's most popular tourist attraction was quiet, except for the Ravens. And we had a chance to do some filming for a future video about who is buried in the chapel. So which one of these is actually the tower? So the tower, the one that was built in the 1070s by William the Conqueror is this. This is the White Tower. And they call it that because they used to whitewash it. After he invaded to, uh, to impose his might on the people of London, who were rather rebellious and not happy about having a French king, the onion domes on the top were installed by Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. But then all these other structures were built at various different times, and they're all kind of mismatched. Late medieval, early modern, Tudor, and that is Tower Bridge. Not London Bridge, Tower Bridge. And that was built in the Victorian era, but it was built faux Gothic to kind of look like the Tower of London, kind of match with it. Good morning, sir. How are you today? Yeah, they can fly away. They like to stay here because they get meat every day. And do you know the story? They get meat every day? The yeah, yeah, other's a raven keeper. Charles II, when he restored the monarchy, he had planned to, to get rid of all the ravens. They were a nuisance. There were thousands of them, but he, he was told the old legend that if the ravens ever left the tower, the monarchy would fall. I had no idea they made that sound. It's a little, uh, a little spooky. 
It is. We're on Tower Green. This is where the high status, especially the women, prisoners were executed. So Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard, Margaret Pohl, uh, Jane Boleyn, Jane Grey were executed here on this spot in Tower Green. Most of the prisoners were executed outside of the tower on Tower Hill, but they had to be subjected to the jeers and the taunts of a massive crowd. So here was the quiet private place where those more honored prisoners were executed. And you can see here there is a beautiful, very modern memorial to them with all of their names listed around. Behind me is the Royal Chapel of St. Peter ad Vicula, Latin for St. Peter in Chains. And this is where the high status victims of the tower would be brought to be buried. Our yeoman warder guide, Gary, gave us some great information. Renovate the place under the orders of Queen Victoria. And when they dug down, they found 1,800 books. Only 38 were reasoned to be executed. But they were all in June in 1874, taken through there into the crypt where they were reburied in the full military and religious ceremonial honors. How did you know? The ones that are executed. Okay. Didn't have their mm -hmm. heads on. Didn't Some were buried with their heads, but not attached. Mm -hmm. Ah! <laughs> These are the three queens we're on about. So if you look to where that large candle is, mm -hmm. if you look to the floor, it's a bit hard to see. This is a coat of arms. And that's Queen Anne Boleyn. So she's buried mm -hmm. directly underneath that uh, where the candle is. Uh -huh. Just to her right, you can just make up that black line on the next coat of arms over. Uh -huh. And that's Queen Catherine Howard. And then just further slightly over is Lady Jane Grey. She's buried up there, but she's not commemorated. She's commemorated on this white stone here. And this was all done in 1875. So these are the names of the ones that we know were executed here. So there's some big names on there. Yeah. Duke mm -hmm. of Monmouth. He was the eldest of the Egypt of children, King Charles II. Tried to assume the throne, mm -hmm. raise an army, him known as a Monmouth. Brother. So he was executed up on Tower Hill. And that was the bloodiest execution mm -hmm. in English history. Took the ex <laughs> execution of five strikes to get his end off. Oh, mm -hmm. He was a real, he was a real botch. The first one landed on the left shoulder, second one on the right shoulder, third one took the top of the head off. In the end, he had to lean down, take out his carving knife, and cut the head through the sinew. Oh, yes. yeah. mm -hmm. that was an amateur. <laughs> he was, he was drunk. In the, the execution of um, Jack Ketch was drunk at the door. Um, but then I suppose you'd have to be doing that kind of job, wouldn't you? I don't think I could yeah. cut something head off sober. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So, in those days, you paid your execution for a swift demise, and when. Um, Took the Monmouth stepped up onto the, up on the scaffold. Jack Ketch held his hand out for payment. Mm -hmm. Monmouth knocked it away and said, Get on with your duty, man. Oh, wow. <laughs> you don't upset your execution. Man. You yeah. Last one, <laughs> just before he's out there. <laughs> Phenomenally, we will be guarding the king. So we'll Ooh. be marching along um, beside the carriage. Wow. We'll be yeah. 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 <laughs> we won't be dressed like this. Okay. We'll be in our state dress. Are you doing any more dress rehearsals for yeah, the big it. event? All That's done. it? All done. Did it go well? It went well. There were a few mistakes, which okay. were, it's going to be a great day. Yeah, yeah it's it's very great exciting. Day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't pour. Well, those uniforms we wear are incredibly heavy anyway and very yeah. hot. So even during the middle of the night, we were still boiling. Oh, so if the sun's yeah. out, we're going to be apt. And if, they, if it does rain, they, they just, mm -hmm. they just, because they're, they're wool, but they just suck oh. up. <laughs> That's terrible. It's just heavy enough. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no painting. Uh, two people went down last the other night. Um, oh, my. So we can, we can carry water in our tunics. Mm. Um, mm. But the problem is, once we march, you can't get to it. Yeah. I mean, you, I'm not going to be hard yeah, down the mountain and have a quick drink. You know, yeah. so it'll, be, um, it'll be kind of uh, on the quiet when, mm -hmm. we're, when we're away. So. It's not like a marathon where you go by the no, Gatorade station. No, no, no. Swiping the bottles of water. Yeah. Together, but, uh, <laughs> Did you walk in the Jubilee or the funeral? You know? uh, yes, all of us stood vigil on Majesty's oh, wow. two nights each. Mm -hmm. I did see that St. Edward's crown, the, the Queen Mary's crown, they're gone yep. already. When did they take them out? Um, so they've been backwards and forwards for the last couple of months, okay. of um, making them sized and cleaned and making sure that the, the, all the, none of the diamonds are going to fall out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's not been used for 70 years. Yeah. You know? A lot of it is gone, mm -hmm. offense, yeah. because it is the crown jewels mm -hmm. of royal regalia. Yeah. Unfortunately, you've come at the wrong time, mm. or the right time, whichever yeah. you look at it. I personally, if I'd come here and paid 30 pounds to get in or whatever it was, I would be wanting a bit of a refund. 
Tell us about being a female. Which is the same as being a man, really. Uh, when were women allowed to? So it was never a no. It was just a criteria that limited those that could apply. Moira Cameron, she arrived 2007. She was the first. Very cool. Yeah, and there's five. Four more since then. What traditionally stopped it was um, you've got to do a minimum of 22 years yeah. in the military, mm-hmm. and a, lot, a while ago, females can only serve up Yeah, to so when I first years. joined the military in 1989, so, if I got pregnant, I would have had to leave. Mm. So obviously, that's changed. Even when you got married, you would have to leave. So that's all changed now, and it's allowing obviously more ladies to be able to apply. What branch did you serve at? I was in the Royal Air Force. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We toured the royal apartments, staged as they would have appeared during a royal stay before a coronation. This reproduction throne is how St. Edward's chair, the one monarchs sit in during their crowning, would have looked before it was defaced by generations of tourists. And here is the chapel where Henry VI was supposedly stabbed to death. On the battlements, we ran into King Charles II and his mistress, Barbara Palmer, and I got to nerd out on my royal genealogy knowledge. Now, currently I'm not married, mm. but obviously if I were looking to have relations with a foreign power, mm-hmm. uh, Portugal, of course, is mm-hmm. a very fine idea. Mm-hmm. Um, Sorry. <laughs> um, and yes. yes. Hopefully we will have children and we won't have to worry of a, an illegitimate having mm-hmm. taken. But it wouldn't be the first time an illegitimate mm-hmm. has. You know that perhaps uh, one of ours will. A descendant of. Ah, uh, yes, is it William? William. Yes. One we are descendant, yes. <laughs> yes, which will be the first related to me. How do you feel about a, a future future great 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 grandson becoming king? I prefer if it was more current. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, better than not. Yes. Toured the monarchy. You, you made the new crown jewels. Yes, of Yes, course. very nice, which we still have today. Yes, which you're going to go on. not here at the moment. No, I yes. know. I'm having my coronation very soon. So. Yes, thank yes. you very much. Thank not you both all. of you. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you. Nice to know something about. After leaving the tower, we made the short walk up Tower Hill, where 120 prisoners were publicly executed amid jeering crowds. A memorial lists their names then back on the tube to Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace here. This used to all be marshland, and James I kept a mulberry farm here where he bred silkworms, which he used for his many beautiful clothes and court dresses for the ladies. The Duke of Buckingham built a house here, and then George III bought it from him and gave it to his wife, Charlotte. She decorated the rooms with a lot of furnishings she got very cheap from people who had been executed during the French Revolution and she had 14 of her 15 children here in this house. Her son, George IV, renovated it. He loved beautiful things, he loved beautiful houses and architecture, so he turned it from a rather modest mansion into this huge palace that we see now. But it wasn't completed until after his death. So his brother, William IV, hated it. He tried to offer it to Parliament when the original House of Parliament burned down. They didn't want it, they wanted to build a new House of Parliament, which is what we have now and Queen Victoria moved in when she became queen in 1837 and she enjoyed this palace in her youth, had many balls here and had a wonderful time. And she made it the official royal residence in London, which it remains today. Her son, Edward VII, and his bride, Princess Alexandra of Denmark, were the first bride and groom to wave from the balcony after their wedding. During World War II, the palace was bombed nine times and George VI and Queen Elizabeth, Bo's lion, were nearly killed. They moved their daughters out to Windsor, where they'd be a lot safer, but they remained in London throughout the war, and their steadfastness made them very popular with the people. At the end of the war, the whole family came out to the balcony to wave to the relieved crowds on DE Day. Queen Elizabeth considered this the office. She came here most of the weekday, and then on the weekend, usually starting on Thursday, because you can do that when you're the queen, she would drive out to Windsor, which she considered her home and her weekend retreat. You can see that the royal standard is flying today, which means that the king is at home. On coronation day, he's going to come out these gates in his carriage, go down the mall this way to Westminster Abbey, and then have his coronation and come back up the mall, drive back in, and then the family will wave from the balcony right there. The palace staterooms are only open a few months each year, and this was not it. But we did tour the Queen's Gallery, which had a fabulous exhibit on fashion during the Georgian era, 1714 to 1837. Just a handful of rooms were packed with so many famous royal portraits, including several of King George III and Queen Charlotte. The costume highlight for me was the wedding dress of Princess Charlotte of Wales, who would have been queen had she not died in childbirth at just 21. 
we stopped in the gift shop to check out the coronation swag. This is a reproduction of Queen Victoria's coronation necklace, which uh, every queen consort and queen since then has worn to the coronation, and Camilla will probably be wearing the original on Saturday. Outside, we scoped out the people camping two days before the coronation, and chatted with a few, which encouraged us to camp out ourselves, after one more night of good sleep at the hotel. And after a ghost walk, our guide Marvin from Seer City Tours told us several spooky stories about London's most haunted house, 50 Berkeley Square, St. James's Palace where Prince Ernst murdered his valet, who still haunts the place, and the mysterious Red Lady of St. James's Park. We took an ethereal boat ride up the Thames under a full moon and arrived where else but back at the Tower of London to hear animated stories of the prison's bloodiest executions. I'll be putting out a video of these and a few other spooky stories from our UK adventure in October. Day 3 Mom went down to the corner shop to get supplies for our camp out. She saw the Zimbabwe delegation to the coronation arrive at the hotel in limos with tons of security. Then we walked over to Westminster Abbey to check out the crowds. We're here at Westminster Abbey and in 24 hours the coronation will be happening inside. It's a slightly wet, perfect London day. It actually poured rain when Queen Elizabeth was crowned in 1953. So Charles might get a much, uh, much better, sunnier coronation than his mother did. So this is Westminster Abbey behind us, built by Edward the Confessor in the 1060s. William the Conqueror was crowned Charles this day in 1066. And almost every coronation has happened here since then, with a few exceptions. But Charles is going to be crowned there tomorrow. We've got 500 scouts from across the UK and across the Commonwealth countries who are all camping just outside London and we're all coming in tomorrow morning and we've got people across Westminster helping steward the crowds. So do say hello to some of our uh, young boys and young girls who are going to be in, in uniform. Ooh, there's bagpipers. We are outside of Parliament Square, right across the way from Westminster Abbey. It's the day before the coronation, about 24 hours. I was hoping we could walk through Parliament Square because there is a statue of Millicent Forsyth right there, who was one of the leaders of the suffragette movement here in Britain. Um, and I would love to have paid homage to her, but we cannot go into the park today. So we can see it from here. Hello, Millicent. And you can see all the flags are fluttering. There's huge crowds out. There's lines to get a photo in front of the telephone phone boxes. It's uh, just a wonderful, exciting atmosphere in London here today. Yay! We took the tube to Fleet Street to Ye Old Mitre Pub. It's down a back alley, so you'd never know it was there if you didn't know where to look. I'm here at Ye Old Mitre Pub, one of the oldest pubs in London, with Judith Norman, who is the landlord, and she's going to tell us all about the history of the pub. It was built in 1546 by the Bishop of Ely, because this was originally on the Bishop's grounds. Uh, we're back onto a private road, Ely Place, and that used to be the Bishop's Palace. Um, so these would have all been strawberry fields and, and parkland. Mm -hmm. And this was built for the servants in the, in the grounds. Um, that's kind of how they so they could come and have a pint. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so it first it was first recorded as a pub in 1546 mm -hmm. um, because Henry VIII had his wedding breakfast over at St Ethelreda's, which is next door. It's the oldest Catholic church in London. With which wife? Uh, with the first one, the Catherine, Catherine of Aragon. Aragon. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the first time. Hence the Catholic church. <laughs> yeah, that's the one before he dissolved the monasteries. Yeah. <laughs> so some of the people that celebrated or maybe some of the servants of the people that celebrated yeah. came here to have a pint after. Yeah, Very yeah. Cool. And then later in time, Elizabeth I convinced the Bishop of Ely to lend part of his garden to Christopher Hatton. He was one of her favourite courtiers. And that's why down the road there it's called Hatton Garden. There's actually a cherry tree in the front bar that Elizabeth I is supposed to have made hold around. When it died and fossilised, they planed it down and now it holds up that side of the pub. So in high weather, you can kind of feel a little bit of a rhythm. The ghosts of Elizabeth. <laughs> dancing them with the May dance again. Yeah. We were protected from the Great Fire of London because of the River Fleet, because mm -hmm. the River Fleet cut off just luckily and saved us, so we never got burnt down or anything. Yeah. So we actually used to have a marriage licence here. It was customary in those days, if your wife died, you married your mistress, mm -hmm. or there was a lot of people in those days whose children were born out of wedlock. So uh, they used to come here and get married, and the pub would actually backdate the children's birthdays to the date they got married, and then they could 
say that they got married in any place and everyone just assumed it was the church when actually it was here. Yeah. So you'd say, there's, there's your brand new baby. He looks like he's about eight years old. What's going on there? <laughs> we had a lot of filming here. Dorinchi Snatch, that's, that was filmed in okay. the front bar. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the British pub culture? The original pub culture sprang about because people used to work really, really long hours and their homes were not particularly comfortable. Um, so they got in after a long day at work. By the time they'd lit a fire and it was hot enough to have actually warmed the room, mm -hmm. and then they tried to cook themselves some dinner, you know, it was basically time to go to bed before they had to get back up again. Mm -hmm. It was much easier and, and more cost effective to leave work and come to the pub. Mm -hmm. You know, the fire was burning, it was warm, there was entertainment, you could socialise. There was usually food available, and then go back and just basically use your home for sleeping. But oddly, moving forward with all this cost of living crisis, in the way things are going, I think might have a return to that. You know, so you think the cost of living crisis is actually boosting pubs? Possibly. I think people are thinking now it's actually cheaper to come out and have two pints so rather than sitting dogs with them with the electric on and the heating and the, you know, if, if you cook a chicken, you know, that gas. Yeah. You know, and you could just buy a couple of toasties and a pork pie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we also filmed segments for a video on the history of alcohol. Then we had a meetup for friends of the channel. We moved upstairs and had a wonderful chat about history history, culture, and London. It was amazing to meet people from all over the world who enjoy my videos and podcast. Hi, I'm Sarah from North Carolina, and I'm here mostly for the coronation, but also because I love London oh, and everything broken. British. That's not exactly I'm Andy. The British presence I'm so from Norway. Right? So my name is Chrissy, and I'm from South Korea. Very cool. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Uh, so I'm Ingrid. I studied photography in London and University of the Arts, but I originally am from Northern Ireland. Paloma, I was born in Madrid in Spain, but I live here in London and I've been here for 11 years. Hi, I'm Valerie from the San Francisco Bay Area, here for the coronation. <laughs> Esteban Feliz and I saw the king visiting Buckingham Palace on the mall. He was doing a royal walkabout like he usually do, greeting, smiling, waving, wow. all of that. And I was right there at the front of the saw everything. You're very, very lucky. Hi, I'm Natalie. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, USA. I'm here for the coronation, visiting London. I'm from Texas, and we're all just really excited for the coronation. My name is Jamisha. I'm a filmmaker, but I used to our new friend Catherine had already been camping out for several days. We left the pub and took a cab back with her, stopped by the hotel, and Catherine had a shower while we packed up our camp chairs, layers for cold and wet weather, food, and camera batteries for the big night ahead. We had a moment of panic when several of the routes to the Mall were blocked, but eventually we found our way back to Catherine's tent and set up a few rows behind her. The atmosphere was electric. Thousands of people from all over the world camping out, celebrating, singing God Save the King, Save the King. getting interviewed by reporters, and generally being very friendly and exuberant. We chatted with those around us and met several brave women traveling on their own. With all the excitement in the air, sleeping wasn't in the cards. We each dozed off for maybe an hour and took turns walking around to go to the port or get hot toasties and cups of tea. Day 4. It's Coronation Day. The atmosphere changed shortly after the sun came up, and people who had slept in a bed all night started arriving and pushing their way in front of the campers. There was a lot of passive-aggressive pushing and people trying to hold the spots they'd worked so hard for. Mom went to use the port one more time and get coffee. After over an hour, I was able to get a hold of her, only to find out that the police had closed a barrier without warning and she was not allowed to re-enter our section of the Mall. After spending all night out, she was stuck behind 20 rows of people and couldn't see anything. We were both very upset, but we soldiered on. After 14 hours outdoors, the King's procession finally began at 10 a.m. At that moment, it started raining and didn't stop. Charles and Camilla passed in the Diamond Jubilee State Coach, built in 2014 for Queen Elizabeth II. 
They were followed by several royals in cars and a small military parade. Once they arrived at Westminster Abbey, the service was played over the loudspeakers. Confess, testify, and declare that I am a faithful Protestant. As there were no visuals or commentary and no one could get mobile reception to watch the service on their phone, it was a bit hard to follow. All this time, groups of soldiers, sailors, and bands kept marching by headed towards the abbey. These were all the people who would be marching back in the larger coronation procession. While the world was watching the service, we got a preview of the parade to come. God save the king! After the two-hour service, the coronation procession began. The king and queen returned in the spectacular Gold State Coach, built in 1760 for George III and Queen Charlotte, and used in every coronation procession since. The Prince and Princess of Wales and other royals followed in carriages and cars. Then came military battalions from all over Britain and the Commonwealth. It was all a spectacular sight to see in person, and so much horse poop. Some time after the parade had ended, they began removing the barriers and allowing people to enter the mall. I was in the section closest to the palace, but several sections behind me were released first. Once my section was released into the sea of people, the enormous size of the crowd hit me figuratively and literally. I'd heard from others who had been to the Jubilee that it is hard to get close enough to see the balcony, so I had low expectations. I kept moving forward and was amazed when the balcony came into view and I was able to keep moving closer. I was overwhelmed to see the royal family waving from the balcony and be in the massive crowd on this historic day. I only wish my mom could have been by my side. When it was all over, I headed back to find her, but barriers and streets were closed everywhere. It took us two hours to find each other and get back to our hotel, which normally would have been a 10-minute walk. We were utterly exhausted after being awake for 36 hours. We ordered room service and had an early, very deep night's sleep. Day 5 we slept in, packed up, and cabbed to the airport. I drove our rental car on the left side, which was not as hard as I thought it might be, to Hampton Court Palace. Henry VIII's Lord Chancellor, Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, originally built this magnificent building for himself, inspired by the Renaissance palaces of cardinals in Rome. But the king wondered why his servant's palace was nicer than any of his. When Wolsey infuriated Henry by failing to secure his divorce from Catherine of Aragon, he handed over Hampton Court as a peace offering, but it didn't work. On his way to the tower to be tried for treason, Wolsey dropped dead. Henry moved in with his second wife, Anne Boleyn. Third wife, Jane Seymour, gave birth to his long-awaited son at Hampton Court, then died of childbed fever. Fifth wife, Catherine Howard, was arrested for adultery here. She escaped her guards and ran down the hallway to try to get to her husband and beg for his mercy, but he ignored her. This is still called the Haunted Gallery, as Catherine's ghost is said to linger. Hampton Court eventually fell out of fashion, until William and Mary came to the throne. They wanted a massive palace to rival their archenemy, Louis XIV of France but they couldn't afford to have a new one built from scratch. So they tore down Henry VIII's favorite palace, Hampton Court, to create this Baroque masterpiece to rival their side. But when Mary died, William lost interest in the project, and only the back was ever completed. The upside was that the front Tudor part of the palace was saved from demolition. To this day, Hampton Court remains a Frankenstein building, Tudor palace in the front, and Baroque palace in the back. We explored William and Mary's state apartments, particularly the collection of 10 portraits known as the Windsor Beauties, which will be the subject of a future video. At our charming inn, we enjoyed a big Sunday roast. They had just finished hosting a Coronation Big Lunch, and people were settling in with pints to watch the Coronation Concert, taking place at nearby Windsor Castle. But we were too tired to join in and hit the hay early. I'm here at the Ostrich Inn in Slough, which is brimming with history and a few ghosts. 
the foundation for the N was laid in 1106 when Henry I was on the throne by Milo Crispin, the landlord, who called it the Hospice, although that was corrupted over the centuries to the Ostrich Inn. For over 900 years, it's been a classic British inn with a lively pub downstairs and rooms upstairs for weary travelers. It's amazing to think how many people have slept in this very building and how many people have died. In the 1600s, the landlord, Jarman, was a murderer. When a particularly wealthy guest would come to stay the night, he would tell his wife that there was a fat pig for slaughter if she wanted it. She would respond with the signal to put him in the sty for later. Jarman would put the unfortunate guest in the best bedroom. After he was asleep, they would remove iron pins, which released the floor on springs. The guest would slide out of the bed into a vat of boiling liquid. The couple would then steal all of their possessions and dump their body in the nearby Colin Brook River. Jarman and his wife's dastardly activities came to an end when they accidentally selected as their victim a well-known clothier, Thomas Cole. They did him in, but they forgot to get rid of his horse, which was found wandering around outside. This led to a search for Cole, and his body was found in the river. According to legend, the river Colin Brook got its name because Cole was found in the brook. Jarman and his wife were arrested and hanged for murder and robbery. Other famous guests of the inn include King John I when he was on his way to Runnymede to sign the Magna Carta. And famous highwayman Dick Turpin stayed here while he was escaping the law. We're staying here for the night and we'll keep a lookout for the ghosts of Jarman's victims. And we'll probably make sure that the bed is secure. Day six, Windsor Castle is the longest occupied palace in Europe and has been a home to the royal family for nearly a thousand years. Like the Tower of London, it was built in the 1070s by William the Conqueror. It was part of a defensive ring of castles surrounding London, but Windsor's location on the Thames made it a convenient retreat for medieval monarchs to get away from the city. Henry II replaced the original wood bailey with stone. Edward III established the chivalric order of the Garter, which still meets at Windsor each June. Edward IV built the current St. George's Chapel. He was buried there, as was Henry VIII, Jane Seymour, and the beheaded Charles I. Queen Anne began the annual tradition of processing to the nearby Royal Ascot racetrack, which continues today. George III was confined to Windsor during his years of mental illness. He and his wife Charlotte ordered the construction of the Royal Vault, where they and most of their descendants have been buried since. Check out my video, Who is Buried in the Royal Vault? George IV renovated the staterooms to the Rococo style in which they appear today. During World War I, King George V renamed the dynasty from the German Saxe Coburg and Gotha to Windsor after the family's favorite English castle. His wife, Queen Mary, had a spectacular dollhouse constructed to highlight British craftsmanship. During World War II, George VI and Queen Elizabeth remained at Buckingham Palace while London was being bombed, but they moved the crown jewels, priceless works of art, and their daughters, Elizabeth and Margaret, to the sturdy medieval fortress. In 1992, a fire broke out and destroyed nine of Windsor's staterooms. The castle was considered uninsurable, and the public protested footing the bill. So the Queen opened up Buckingham Palace and ticket revenue was used to repair Windsor. The castle was Elizabeth II's favorite home. She and Prince Philip spent the COVID-19 quarantine here. They were both laid to rest in St. George's Chapel in a vault they share with her parents and sister. We explored the lovely town of Windsor and had delicious pies and pints at the Horse and Groom, a Royal Ascot-themed pub. 
Day seven. On our drive, we stop to visit a few antique shops. Mom is a dedicated and talented antiquer. If you're ever in Cornelius, North Carolina, check out her booth at Oak Street Mill. Ask for Wendy. We each bought a few unique souvenirs to bring home. Mom named her Staffordshire dogs, Charles and Camilla. I'm at Hever Castle, south of London, where the Boleyn siblings spent their youth. Hever was probably my favorite stop on our trip, and the only castle we visited which was never a royal residence. The stone keep was built in the 1200s. In 1462, wealthy merchant Geoffrey Boleyn purchased it, and his descendants built a Tudor manor house inside the stone walls. His great-granddaughter, Anne Boleyn, was raised here. I'll have a video about Anne's childhood and her siblings in the future. King Henry VIII came to Hever to court Anne and stayed in this bedroom. This is the original lock he had installed to secure his safety. On display were a number of Tudor costumes from recent films and series, including Elizabeth I's coronation gown and regalia from the 1998 Kate Blanchett movie. They also had an astonishing array of original portraits throughout the castle and in the long gallery, which was installed by Anne of Cleves. When the Boleyn family died out, Henry VIII granted Hever to his fourth wife as part of her divorce settlement. In 1903, American millionaire William Waldorf Astor restored Hever Castle and used it as a family home. We had another lovely pub supper at the Wheat Sheaf, and then drove on to Leeds Castle to spend the night. Day 8. I'm at Leeds Castle. It's been called the loveliest castle in England, and it certainly lives up to the name. Leeds is also England's ladies' castle. Over the centuries, it has often been strong women who have owned, enjoyed, protected, and renovated this place. It's been a holiday retreat to generations of medieval queens, the site of a deadly skirmish between two great ladies, the literal place of conception of the Tudor dynasty, a prison for two accused royal witches, and a playground for English aristocracy and Hollywood stars. I will be doing a dedicated video all about Leeds Castle and all the women who have been part of its history. After exploring the castle, we had afternoon tea overlooking the lake. Then we conquered the hedge maze and shell grotto. I remember this from my childhood. And we met the hawks and owls, including these weak old chicks. The reason why I'm so drawn to history, and English history in particular, uh, aside from the fact that my mom is mostly English, Scottish, and Irish, is that we used to actually live here in England when I was ages 8 to 12. Mom and my stepdad Carlos were attached to RAF Lakenheath Air Force Base, but we actually lived in the local community and I went to the local school, where I was taught a lot about history and frequently went on school trips to castles like Leeds. I remember coming to Leeds when I was about 11 years old and absolutely falling in love with it. I have been back a few times with friends and with my husband, but it's so nice to come back with my mom for the first time and relive all of our memories from that time in our lives. So now we're at Leeds Castle, the end of our trip. We're heading home tomorrow. It's been wonderful. We're excited to get back, but we'll also miss England and uh, remember our wonderful memories from our time here. Bye! I have a ton more footage and information about the places we saw. Some of it I plan to use in future videos. But if there's something you'd like to see more of, please let me know in the comments. Want even more tea on history? Check out the History Tea Time podcast. You can now follow History Tea Time on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.